We have an amazing speaker with us today, Dr. Onder Ishtek. Uh, what I can say very briefly, although in his presentation he will tell about his life as well, but um, uh, Onder was born with a vis visual impairment in the south of Turkey and against all odds he managed to get the best possible education in Turkey and abroad and currently is uh, working in the university, Aksara University in Turkey, as a, 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 a assistant professor at the Department of Special Education, and is also an active advocate of uh, equal rights and equal opportunities for people with different disabilities. He is also an interesting person and a lifelong traveler, if I can say, but I will not tell you more because now I would like to uh, pass the floor to Onder to present himself and to start today's ID Talks. I wish all of us a productive day. Onder, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Anna, for the uh, kind words and nice uh, introduction. Um, I think it puts more pressure on me, but, uh, and I would like to especially thank to all SALTO teams for the kind invitation. It is my uh, pleasure. At the same time, it's a pl uh, privilege for me to be here and a special thank you for the, all people who participated here. Uh, and actually, I know there are a couple of faces. They wrote me um, from the chat that they ca came to listen to me. So thank you so much. And uh, I, I send my regards, warm regards and hugs to everyone, uh, wherever you are at this hard time. So two seconds, I wanna start to share my screen. Two, sorry, two seconds only, I will make you wait. No problem at all. Please take it. Okay. Share screen. Sorry for taking me a little bit longer because I use a screen reader and that's a little bit. And then later on, I will be faster, promise. Is the screen all right now, Anna? Looks amazing. Yes, okay, everything thank you so is okay. much. Um, as Anna mentioned, my name is Önder Işlik, um, and I was born in southern part of Turkey. And today, briefly, if I need to uh, give an overview about the presentation or about the session, uh, I will like to talk about my life, so what I have done so far and a uh, little bit what I learned actually, because I think it's a journey which we all learn gradually until end of our life. So uh, I'm teaching, but at the same time I'm learning. I think I'm a full-time learner as well in that case. So <clears throat> I was born actually with visual impairment in Southern part of Turkey. It's only 20 kilometers away from the Syrian border. So uh, it's a lovely region, part of Turkey. It's called Antioch or Hatay, Antakya. It is also a very diverse city, which is I am always proud of and uh, kind of admire. And uh, so, but for me, the life wasn't that much easy. Uh, so I was born with visual impairment and I am one of the nine uh, children of a farmer family. So my it's quite, it is a remote area, so it's a village. And uh, my father only attended to primary school, so five years of schooling, and my mom never had a chance to go to school. So um, for this reason, I am very kind of keen and uh, advocating or trying to at least uh, support both people with disabilities and women. And since Women International Days was just a couple of days ago, and I don't think it is like, 
uh, day to celebrate, but simply I think it is a day of recognizing and same for me about the disability. So uh, simply I was in actually very low or difficult conditions because of my disability. My parents didn't have that much educational uh, knowledge about how to raise a child with visual impairment. And on top of that, when I was four, I had a very serious illness. So I had a stroke. Simply, I couldn't use my entire body. Even I could not move my neck. So when I was sleeping, my neck if goes down of the pillow and I was just feeling the pain, but could not move my neck. I couldn't move my fingers. So the only functioning organs or part of my body was like mouth, eyes and ears. I mean, I don't know how to, to correct to say eyes, at least eye brushes or eyelashes, let's say. So simply, uh, I experienced of being both uh, in a very tough physical impairment and also visual impairment. Uh, but, and another thing, which is now I am very pleased uh, to have it, but at that time, because my town or my village is very uh, close to the Syrian border, so the, everyone in my village speaks uh, Arabic rather than Turkish. So simply, I didn't speak the, the mother tongue or the native language of the country. So when I went to school, I didn't speak the language. So imagine I was visually impaired. I, uh, after a year, I recovered from my stroke or physical impairment, but still I have some physical uh, appearance differences and the people were bullying me because of my, the way how I walk and uh, because of my lack of vision. And on top of that, like the language barrier at the school. Uh, I don't want to kind of say my age, but simply it was a, a couple decades ago. And at that time, of course, we had uh, problems regarding the education at the rural areas when it comes to special education, even, even it's much more difficult. So for this reason, I never received any special education services. And some people might consider it the inclusive school, but I was actually included only physically. Uh, but year, day by day, I, as I start to learn the language, I develop my skills and I start to kind of listening to classes rather than reading and other things. So uh, basically I wasn't actually successful that much at my school. So I was mostly the failure one. And actually even in the seventh, no, sixth grade after I finished like the primary school in my village, because all the kids were like me. So their mother tongue wasn't Turkish, but the education language was Turkish. So, uh, and then I moved to the city center whereby ev almost everyone's mother tongue is Turkish. So it was much more high, high quality education. So it means much more difficulties for me to understand and follow with the classes. And as I said, since um, my parents didn't know how to raise a child with visual impairment, my teachers, they didn't know how to teach a students with visual impairment. Often I was the failure. I had like, uh, I, I was taking, I think, 10 classes and seven of them I failed. So it was F or zero, one, let's whatever to say. At the time, of course, like I started to develop a uh, negative mood about me as well, because I started to think, okay, I'm visually impaired. I cannot do this and that. And I convinced myself I am not able to, to do anything. Uh, but later on, uh, so I didn't give up when I look at my, environment, I didn't have too many options about what I could do. And then I said, no, like, you know, I'm not going to quit that much uh, easily. And I would continue to fight to do my best. So I was uh, kind of reach out, try to get some audio materials to study. I was paying uh, my little brother all of my weekly income from my parents, which I got. It was little, but I was telling him, okay, if you read 10 pages of this book for me, I will give you like 10 liras, five liras so that you can get ice cream or whatever. And uh, so uh, kind of was quite tough time to study, but still I was a, uh, successful in passing the university entrance exam, which was so surprising for everyone, including my mom, because uh, she was always telling me not to study because she said, you know, your brother, your cousins who were able could not do this and you are blind. so. You, probably you are not going to be able to do it anyway. So why are you forcing yourself and other things? So she was kind of discouraging me, but with a good intention because she didn't want me to get sad. Probably she didn't want me to 
uh, feel uh, hopelessness and other things. But I always kind of uh, continued. And I think that's like the, uh, I, I want, like in our culture, we are supposed to be humble and I want to keep to stay humble. But I think I cannot ignore that. I think I was lucky in terms of uh, intellectual ability. So I was able to succeed with little study. But same, likewise, when I went to the university, so I was actually listening to modules and then uh, still, I was so embarrassed to go to lectures and ask them to do any modifications for me, like in terms of providing accessible materials and other things. But later on, I found it is kind of difficult. I'm not going to be able to continue. And then I start to ask the friends uh, to study together, which is a little bit funny story because in the beginning, they were not that much happy to study with me because they were reading for me, blah, blah. And then they recognize that actually when they start to read their notes, I remember all of the lectures. So actually when they were telling, oh, th I took this note, but I don't know what it means. I said, oh, don't worry. I know at that time the lecture said this and this, he means that probably he will ask this question. So simply they were reminding me and I was delivering the lectures back to them. And uh, a day like later on, of course, I started to be much more successful because of my friend's support. And then I finished the university. Again, we have a, like a, uh, in order to be able to work as a public teachers at the public schools, we need to take exams. And I was successful in that one. But because of my disability, maybe in some other countries, there might be similar rules. But uh, in my country, uh, if you got a, like a visual impairment, historically, you could not work as a kindergarten or a primary school teacher. Uh, I know it is silly. But I think they were thinking maybe we could hurt the students. But generally, the explanation is, you know, if the children would see someone with a disability as a teacher, they would get like psychologically uh, affected in a negative way or whatever. So simply, I wasn't allowed. Uh, just I could work a couple months, and then I wasn't allowed to teach, even though I was successful in the exam. What I have done, of course, I was sad sitting down. Uh, I don't remember if I if I cried, but probably I did. Uh, but I was quite sad and I said, oh, kind of hopeless what I would do now because I don't have any other options. I was, they told me to finish the high school. I finished it. They told me to study, the, pass the test. I passed it to be a university student, graduated. And then again, you know, bureaucratical barriers. I tried to work in a public, a private school for a while. And of course, when you go to the private places, you have the negative attitude about you are disabled. Why should I hire you kind of things? And of course, as I mentioned earlier, because I didn't have self-confidence when I was, I was already hesitating or afraid to go to those places. And generally when they asked me some things or I was so afraid they would ask me something. But <clears throat> I didn't, Again, like when I was sitting, I said, what I would do? Okay, that's, that shouldn't be the only option. There should be other possibilities or options. And I was always dreaming about actually kind of being a lecturer at Tunis or whatever. And then there was another test, which is uh, for the people in Turkey to, study, to go abroad to study and then come back and work at the universities. And I took that exam. Again, I was quite successful. There were like just four people sent in that year from my field, and I was one of them. But uh, they ask a full medical report. And in the medical report, it says, if you got a disability, you are not eligible. You cannot get, it's, I know like in terms of legislation, it's almost like a, a discrimination, a openly discrimination. And then I said, okay, I'm not going to quit that much easily. Yes, the rule says you cannot do this if you've got a disability, but I will try to do my best to, to achieve this. And how could I do it? Uh, you know, in some TV shows, they say, don't try this at home. And I'm telling you, don't try this maybe at home. Uh, but I cheated the system. So how I did it, I had a very good friend of mine, which we studied together, and he got the same scholarship to go to the, uh, to the United States as well. Uh, we were going to the language school together, and then I needed to go to like a uh, minister of education to sign a document because I was 
always telling them they were asking me for uh, to come and I said oh I have something busy can I send my petition or other things so I did everything remotely but that was the end I was just going to go to the US a couple of weeks later and then I need to sign that document if they understand I got a visual impairment probably they would not let me to go so we practiced with a with that friend to be I was the shy person he was the friend who is just uh, accompanying me. And then I was like gently holding from back of his shirt without, by hiding my hand. And then we walked. And then he, when he come to the table, I was telling him because he was walking like a half step ahead of me. And then he like hold it with the pan and gave it to me with his right hand. But actually with his left hand, I taught him earlier, he, he was pointing where I was going to sign. So he gave me the pen. Of course, I know where the pen is, but I wasn't looking at the pen or pencil. I was looking at his other finger. So I saw, of course, I found the finger, I signed it. And when I was out of the uh, office, I was like incredibly shocked because I was sweating. It's like, a, I think definitely could be a Hollywood movie <laughs> in that sense. And I was, yeah, successful to get the scholarship and to travel to abroad. And of course, at the time, I wasn't thinking for too long because my biggest aim to get that scholarship so that I can go abroad. And then when I landed there, I said, shoot, what I'm going to be doing? I cannot see well. I don't know anyone. My language ability is so poor because I learned the language after that, getting that scholarship. So it was quite difficult but i think as a human being as long as we don't quit we always find a way to uh, be successful so i was actually just uh, a year after studying english i was accepted to my master's program at California, san francisco state university in the department of special education and i finished my undergraduate sorry my master's degree shorter than anticipated. So I finished it in uh, just a little bit over a year, uh, less than one and a half year. And then my uh, GPA, like average grade was 3.98 out of four. So almost it was actually uh, 400 out of four. Uh, so it was an incredible success for me because one of the biggest difference was they offered me accessible materials to study. So even though I didn't speak the language well, but and it, the master's is much more difficult than the primary school or undergraduate degree. So I was quite successful. Later on, I came to Turkey and then I was telling to Minister of Education, I'm gonna go to, you know, to UK because the university I got accepted for my PhD in the US, it's a very small town with very poor uh, public transportation. And the lady told me that, okay, you write a petition, mention that you have visual impairment and for this reason, you could not, uh, it's gonna be difficult for you to live in the US in that small city. And then we will approve to go to the UK. And they said like, you know, in the legislation, it's openly said, if you got a disability, you cannot get from this scholarship. And same for me. So until today, I just, I was hidden. So your ministry doesn't know me that I got a disability. And then she said, you know, you already proved that you could be successful and you were like already graduate from very high prestige university with very high grade. So now there will be no problem at all. And then thank, uh, I think that was the one of, they approved my uh, uh, request. But one of the important thing after me, they start, they changed the rule. And so far, at least I know like five or six people with visual impairment and different disabilities, they got that scholarship and they travel to the different countries to do their uh, to studies and come back and work in Turkey. So that was the one of the biggest, I think, influence I had. Uh, of course, when the Minister of Education did not let me to be a teacher, I filed cases in the courts and other things. Um, so later on, after I finished, to cut it short, I don't want to keep it for too long and get you bored, but uh, I finished my PhD studies and come to Turkey to work. And of course, like, there is the bias again, how, how are you gonna be teaching? And then of course, because I know now what, how to do things. And I, even before they asked me, I started to explain to them, you know, yes, I am visually impaired, 
but I can use the technology. So I do this and that this way. And of course, in the beginning, again, they said yes, but they start to give me little modules, less uh, responsibility just to try me. And after, I think after just like one semester, when they saw what I could do in terms of the university and other things, they gave me extra responsibility. So I am the now the disability coordinator of my university. I am the kind of uh, vice head of the department and I do a couple other things. So simply, I think I start from very disadvantaged environment and gradually I could change uh, things by of course fighting and also by, um, you know, change being a maybe role model. I don't like this to say this, but I think again, I think the people now in where I work, mostly they are much more open to uh, hire or work with someone with visual impairment after that. And of course, my biggest hobby is traveling because um, when I was like uh, with my parents, my dad was incredibly overprotective. So he wasn't even let me to go almost to the street. And uh, I didn't want to restrict my life. So I said, okay, I will take the risk. What could be done? Uh, there was a lady from the United States. She, was, she had a visual impairment as well. And she said like, you know, I got lost several times, but none of them was permanent. And they said, yeah, I like this idea. And then I will go out, try to explore it. Even if I have like small accidents, everyone could have it. So the experiences I would learn, they would be much bigger than the risks simply because we are sitting at home and everything could happen to us. But, uh, and so the outside is not that much risky than inside. The only thing we need to uh, overcome our fears, I think. So, and then, especially since my parents did not uh, kind of let me to do lots of things because they were so concerned. So I tried, to, I start not to tell them. So I did things and then later on I start to tell them. And then I, I've now, uh, I have some pictures I wanna show you. And actually they are like now, so far I have been around uh, 60 countries in five continents. So there are some pictures from different parts of the world actually. Um, for example, like for me, when I was a child, it was a dream about elephants or tigers or other things or the Africa or Asia. And then when I started to like do travel gradually, the first incidents and most of my traveling, except one country, all of them, I have done them by myself and they were amazingly uh, impressive. Now I'm looking forward to Corona to be over and try uh, to be back because when I go out, Yes, I got lost on the streets, but I experienced the local atmosphere, the food, I have to communicate with the people, the music and lots of other things. I don't know if there is any visually impaired to describe, if I have to describe the pictures, but since I already been talking for lo too long. Um, so simply I got like uh, on the elephant in the pyramids, I have like in Central Asia, this is one of the actually very, very first trip, which you could see also I am quite young um, and I have a like alligator holding in my hand because we don't have them in Turkey. And like, I was so curious what kind of these animals they are and other things. Uh, this is like one of the uh, skydiving experience. Uh, also, I did actually scuba diving, I think maybe already past that picture, but this was in California as well. And I, I was already afraid of height actually. So now you could say, okay, you are afraid of height. How can you jump from an airplane <laughs> with a parachute? Yes, I know it's like contradictory, uh, but for me, I think one of the biggest strategy is to go over my fears rather than running away from them. And uh, again, it was like, one of the scariest moments in my life and also one of the best time in my life. Uh, I want to say two words, like a funny story about this, because when I jumped from the airplane, I thought I was just going to fall directly without anything. And then I was spinning around 360 degrees. I started to get nervous. I said, probably I have done something wrong <laughs> and now I'm going to uh, hit the ground. But now everything was perfect. And I yeah did the skydiving. Uh, I, this is another picture, but I cannot see the details in it and I don't remember the order anyway. So, 
So far, that's the kind of the story. And now I got uh, just two short things to share with you. And then I'll uh, kind of go move to the next uh, section, at least to uh, have the answer your questions and have the other discussions. Uh, so as I mentioned, <clears throat> for me, I think, yes, I feel like I was successful. If you believe in God, maybe it is like the God will or, uh, you know, other things, whatever. So I, I feel like I was ex actually, yeah, lucky. I was to maybe uh, I got the opportunities which many people may not have. And also I did, I, I have also some uh, other uh, kind of, um, you know, sorry, uh, because of the screen reader read the last message. Thank you. I will read all of them in a minute, but, so simply, um, I was not, I was lucky, I think. I consider myself lucky from all aspects, but also there are some people, many people with visual impairment or with other disabilities, because according to World Health Organization, it's like more than 15% of the whole population is influenced by disability. Some of them are visible disabilities, some of them not. So um, for me, I didn't say only yes, I survived and now time to rest and enjoy my life. Of course, I'm enjoying my life and I do enjoy my, with whatever I do, but also I'm taking other responsibilities, hopefully to help others. So one of the things I'm doing at the moment, as I said, mentioned, I'm a disability coordinator of my university. Um, and our criteria is definitely not the Turkish standards. So yes, in Turkey, there are some universities do, doing quite good jobs. But for us, based on my experience, I do take the reference in the US, Canada, and other European countries, and always trying to push forward. In the beginning, of course, my university, like, you know, they were not willing to give me such a position. But uh, I was always criticizing. But what, when I was criticizing, uh, which I do hate really, like when the just people say about the negative things. So I was always coming with a suggestion. So yes, this is, this is a problem, but you could solve this by doing this and that. And I think they like this idea. And now we are really lucky in Aksara University because our like vice president and the president of the university, they are really keen to make sure we have quite accessible environment. And always our like rector or vice, uh, the president of the university says, we wanna be an institution, not only the, people with disabilities could attend. We wanna be an institution which they would especially prefer or try to come to us. In that sense, we have definitely working on making the, you know, the content of the lectures accessible, the buildings, and then of course the social uh, a bit of it, because generally people, I think we forget just they try to make the buildings accessible. So being in the classroom, like I was in the primary school is not inclusion. So for this, uh, I work with the closely with our university students who have a disability and the ones without disability. So we lead them, we inform them how to, you know, uh, manage things, how to advocate and how to uh, get things done. Uh, another thing we do actually, uh, again, because of our, uh, normally my responsibility is, to, or our department's responsibility to serve people with disabilities at our university, university students. But because we live in a like a kind of smaller city based on Turkish conditions, and it's not the best city with the necessary resources. So we actually uh, as a department and department of special education we said okay we are that many people experienced or knowledgeable about special education let's offer services for free to all people who may not have money or they may not have the uh, braveness to, to come to or apply for services so we actually kind of guide we, we do like assessment and inform all people with disabilities and their parents. And sometimes we go to their schools, to kids schools or workplaces to give them uh, how to how they could do things, how they can become independent or how they could support their children. Because when I was, as I said, like I appre really appreciate what my parents uh, done or approaches, but they didn't know anything about disability. So they couldn't support me in that sense at all. And I was one of 
the only person with visual impairment in my town village. I didn't know the other people in the city. So I didn't know where to ask for things. And the peer learning is very important. So we do support them in that sense. So that's one of the way I am giving back to my society or to the people like me. So simply um, uh, because of my role uh, in the de both Department of Special Education and Disability Coordinator, we do organize online events like uh, this talk, for example, regarding disability and different subjects. So about employment rights, uh, sorry, about employment, about social rights and other uh, things to create awareness again for both people with disabilities, their parents, and also the, at the university community for the teachers and uh, sort of lectures and students. So that, because we know that our university students, they are gonna be the president of the country in this later on, or the mayor of the city, or an architecture of the building, which I complain always. So we, if we know actually, and always I tell to my students, you know, if you are complaining about the people on the street, don't forget you are the responsible ones because we as a teachers, we prepare those people, maybe not those kids, but their parents or their children simply. And as educators, we have a huge power so to change. And in that sense, yes, I do organize uh, some events. And in my lectures, I offer lots of lectures, uh, compulsory and also like some elective modules and try to raise awareness again for the teachers when they are going to be working with people with this, uh, students with disabilities in the mainstream schools or even i have like um from uh, health school to religious school so like i offer modules in different schools just to create awareness because again disability is everywhere sometimes we recognize people with disabilities sometimes we don't but if we don't see them it doesn't mean it, they don't exist they are there but just we don't know and try to like create an accessible environment or society uh, I already mentioned about the talks. For example, tomorrow I have a, like a talk in Hungary, uh, in one of the universities in Hungary. So uh, again, share knowledge. And um, later on, I will touch to this point one more time. Uh, and also, we do like a online teaching, uh, uh, like a informal teaching, let's say. So if we reach someone with this, with vision impairment who needs math or uh, let's say computer skills or independent living skills. We also uh, personally, I, and I try to organize other volunteers and support that person and his family as much as possible. I do work with some NGOs. I am a member of one of them, for example, which is very influential in Turkey. Um, it's called like visually impaired in education. So simply they are very young professionals, which I really admire. Uh, so they have fighting for completely equal rights. So we are against the positive discrimination as well as negative discrimination. We don't, we, as long as if something is accessible, that's perfect, but it is. So with this organization, for example, there was a test similar to TOEFL, like English test. And uh, it was the, one of the first computer based and they didn't let the people with disabilities to take that test because of the poor accessibility. And uh, so this organization sued that the kind of testing center. And then of course they, because of the, you know, I don't want to go to too much politics, but the legal system wasn't perfect. So they lost that case, but they didn't quit. And because of the like 1000 lira, uh, Turkish lira need to be paid for the uh, lawyer cost of that testing center. So these guys, they gathered with lots of people and they got like one coin. So like $1 or one euro, it's only one lira with the huge bag. And they went to the testing center. They paid that money with like one lira. It took them like, I don't know, the whole day maybe to count the coins. And of course there was the media there and they were actually quite, uh, you know, created awareness. And the testing center, even though they win the case in the court, they won the case, they said, you know, yes, maybe we should reconsider this. And now that test is accessible for the blind and people with disabilities, they could go and take that test as much like uh, their uh, peers who doesn't have a disability. So simply uh, fighting or advocating is really working. Yes, sometimes it's difficult doing it individually, but as a group as a, or as an association or whatever, 
uh, it is really functional. Uh, that's the last one. I'm an entrepreneur at the same time. So what does it mean? I have a, uh, in Turkey, based on our legislation, the university uh, staff, they could have firm or company in only in the techno parks, like um, technology areas or districts. So me and other colleague, we set up a small company uh, and we are producing accessible educational materials for people with disabilities. So we are very new. It is, we are just like around a year old, old now. Still, we are not making money. We are spending out, from our, uh, uh, out of our back, uh, pocket. What the, is the aim is here? Because uh, you know, local currency is quite weak and many people with disabilities, they could not afford to buy very expensive materials tools. And because, uh, you know, like when we are talking about a cell phone, smartphone or computer, the companies, they can really keep it the, uh, the prices low because they are serving the whole market. But when it comes to people with disabilities, it's a small uh, market and they really increase the prices. And in this case, the other people could not purchase. So the aim is producing the accessible educational materials in Turkey for very, very low cost simply for the cost of the actual material so we are like three people one of them is an engineer so i generally the one who give the ideas and they are the ones who are trying to produce it and then we discuss how to manage it blah blah and we are just about to finish a graphic machine uh, which is in turkey sold around twenty thousand turkish liras roughly like uh three thousand dollars and we are hoping to sell it for just like 300 or 400 dollars or even maybe cheaper based on the uh, quantity and we want to expand this to to solve other things so simply from very pessimistic person who i was depressed later on i start to find ways to also help others uh, to progress in their life or they have different opinions uh, at this time, I would like Anna to show you a very short couple of seconds of a video, please. Yeah, something super exciting, please. Shall I stop <laughs> sharing? I think. Uh, Maria, Maria is doing it. Oh, sorry. You, if Maria. you stop sharing, Maria will take over. Just two seconds. Okay, Zoom meeting. Stop recording. Oh no, I was almost. <laughs> Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yes. If you could just make it full screen then. Yes, of course. Onlar işte geliyor. Merhaba. Merhaba. Hoş geldiniz. Hoş bulduk. Teşekkürler. Hoş geldiniz. Hoş bulduk. Merhabalar. Merhaba. Yes, uh, Maria, I think we can stop now. And of course, we would like to hear on there a little bit of an explanation. What was going on right now on the screen? Yes. So uh, simply, I probably in many countries, you have a different version or similar version. If it's so, it is the, in Turkey, it's called Who Wants to a Millionaire uh, TV show, actually. It is one of the very, very popular TV shows in Turkey. So I participated in that show approximately a year ago. So my aim, course wasn't to be a millionaire <laughs> but my main aim was actually uh, I wanted to uh, you know because it's watched for many people and sometimes yes there are some people with disabilities they are on the show but mostly it's like about the PT uh, side of it so they said oh yeah I got this disadvantage that advantage uh, but I wanted to show that show the people actually no yes we got disability but it is still we can do some things, we can be happy, we can travel and other things. And in this show, uh, like they offered me human guide, 
And I said, no, thank you, because I can walk until like everyone by myself. And uh, yes, after a moment, I cut the hand of the, uh, to, uh, the pe person, uh, presenter of the show, but he was shaking hands and, uh, you know, hugging people at that point anyway. So actually, simply, I was walking to the same point, without, like the people without disabilities, with my cane. And uh, the conversation mostly was about, you know, how you could do this with visual impairment or what will be your messages to people with disabilities or the people in society. So I think it was a good way of, for me to create awareness. And later on, of course, I got some like phone calls, emails, and they invited me to offer some talks um, and uh, do a couple of things. And actually, I, I'm not a user of Twitter, but um, my sister-in-law, my brother, my friends, all of them, they were calling me and they said, what did you do? Because all of the messages you gave, they are like TT or uh, on the top of the hashtags because uh, there were like some sentences about disability, about troubling and other things. Simply people, they start to quote me and use that, those messages in social media. And I think that was really influential, uh, like a huge crowd. So for, I had a, such a lovely experience. I think it was a, for me like to be, uh, again, a memory, but also to create awareness. And uh, the person who, uh, on the TV show, he was really impressed. And they, even the TV channel, they said, oh, the person with, with disability surprised uh, us kind of things. So maybe some people are curious if I was, I, if I became a millionaire, no, <laughs> I couldn't. But actually I, I think in total there were 12 questions and uh, I, I was up, went up to the eighth question and I was so fast and quick, but then I was very excited, got nervous, so I said, uh, I think I couldn't manage the being on the cameras in that sense. So even though I had like the jokers to go at least one or two more questions, so I ended up the story there. So for me, that was a good um, um, point of my life. I just have one couple, one slide only, and then I think we will get the questions from you and Okay, share screen. Share screen. Okay. Now I go back to my slide. Oops, sorry. I need to go to the find. I know many people here are youth workers <coughs> and uh, Yes, some of the work I have doing it is slightly different from what you do. But for me, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a life learn lifetime learner. So based on my experience, I learn some things and which I think could be helpful to you. But it's again, not comprehensive list or not professional at all. Just like I was thinking as a closing, what I could say. And I think based on this experience, uh, I think one of the main important things to make sure people with disabilities, they are aware of their abilities. So when I was younger and through entire my life, I heard lots of times, you could not do this, you could not do that. So I, and I hate it when the people tell me what I could do and what I could not do. And I, my principle was, no one could tell me what I could do or not. I wanna recognize or discover my abilities myself. So I did like skydiving. Actually, I drove a jet ski. I drove a Ferrari and uh, lots of other crazy things. Um, and I was in a cage with tigers and lions. So I touched them in my life. So uh, that was really impressive. And I could, all, after all of them, I said, you told me you could not do it, but I could do it actually. So I do hiking. I go to camping with some groups and uh, you know stay for the weekend in a tent and do lots of other things. And of course, I'm not perfect or I'm not a superman. So there, were, there are things which I could not do. As I mentioned earlier, because of my physical impairment, for example, I could not do skating, ice skating or uh, skiing. And I tried, of course, but I, I wasn't 
just saying, okay, people told me you cannot do it, but I didn't believe them. I said, I want to try it at least. Yes, I fall on the snow or I fall on about my butt on the ice, but still all of them great experiences, learning. I have now better idea how the skiing works, how ice skating works, the equipments they use and all of those. And I, at least I could say, yeah, I don't think I can do it with, of course, I can, maybe I can do it with some adjustments, but based under the circumstances, I cannot do it. And because same for the education and traveling and all of the things in my life, as you would remember, my mama was telling me, you could not, I could not do uh, pass the university entrance exam. But I said, you know, in my mind, no, I will try and you will see I could do it or I could not do it. So simply make sure people with disabilities or uh, you with disabilities you are working with. Uh, and often, as I said, from very young ages, we are taught uh, or we are told what we could not do. So to change that, I think creating opportunities and uh, always thinking, okay, you wanna do this, but how, what kind of things you would need to do or adjustments so that you can do it. Again, do not give up. I think people with disabilities, sometimes we quit, not only with disabilities, but everyone. And I think, uh, as I said, like they did not hire me as a teacher. I sued them in the court and then I lost the court, but I didn't give up. I was always trying again. And then I, when I was failing, yes, I was sitting down and then resting and then try again. Because when I, if I quit in my life, like the high school when I was, or primary school when I was unsuccessful, I think, I would be completely in a different position or different place. So in my life, uh, if I, yeah, I do my best and try to not to quit. Being hopeful and useful. I think hope is very important, but it is like a drug. If you give it too much, the person could die. <laughs> if you don't give it, it will feel pain. So I think adjusting, yeah, let's try to see if you could do that, or at least there are, other possibilities, uh, I think that's very important. And taste of being successful. When I started to travel in the beginning, I was so scared, like highly scared, shaking. But when I could do a little bit, I said, wow, like being successful is so nice. It's like, I wanna do it again. I wanna be successful again. And uh, I think that motivates me to move on. Uh, again, like as a person with disabilities, I think I was told too much, I could not uh, do things and I felt I am very unvaluable. Uh, but then when I could see I can contribute, like the, similar to the girls in my undergraduate, they, they were asking me to study and I was saying, you know, the exam is eight in the morning. I don't want to wake up at six or seven just to study. And I know this class, I, I will pass it. But they were pitying me to go and study with them because after a while they recognized that actually it's a mutual help. They were reading things to me, but they were learning more than uh, they read from the books or the uh, materials uh, from me. So they were actually kind of uh, insisting me to go and study with them. When you look at from outside, yes, uh, very kind people helping a person with visual impairment to study, but in reality, I think they were helping me and I was helping them as much as they were helping me. Small steps, I think that's like one of the things because sometimes we have fears, but with little uh, gradually we could see that, oh, as a person with disabilities, I can have fun or I can do this, then I think we would be willing to take further steps. So I think keep it, that in mind is very important. Role models, or even if not role models, someone who are in the same position with them is very helpful because again, I was feeling pain of this throughout my teenager or youth because I didn't know any point with visual impairment until I went to the university. But if I knew earlier, I would know like how people with disabilities or visual impairment read their materials, how they travel and blah, blah, blah. So I think being with the people who are in the same position are very important, but of course, also having role models because, uh, you know, just the negative image people with disabilities could not do is really, uh, jeopardizing the opportunities or future of people with disabilities. <clears throat> I think uh, no one is perfect. That's like 
when I recognized this, this was a huge step for me, milestone, because yes, people told me I could not do this and that, and I know I, am, I cannot see or I can blah, blah. But I know that other people are not perfect either. And I think if we got a, like a magic stick and we could do, change everything uh, as, as whatever we wanted, I think many people, almost everyone would have something to change about their appearance, their life, blah, blah. And then I know not only the people with visual impairment, but other people break things or fall, uh, drop things or get lost. So I think knowing not being perfect and uh, I don't, accepting also, I don't have to be perfect. So it's okay to be fail or it's okay to uh, be like other because we are not different than other people. We are human beings. Not everyone who's able, uh, able without disability is a like genius or uh, I don't know. As I mentioned, trying, retrying, it's always like finding different paths. It's not only just one path, uh, I think. I think, okay, that's another for me uh, and last message. For me, when I was, you know, tried hard to be a teacher, I passed the exam three times and did lots of things and uh, it didn't happen later on. I mean, maybe it could happen later on, but for me, at that time, I always in my life recognize that if something doesn't happening despite all, of all hard work, so then it means maybe the God or future or destiny, whatever we say, has a better plan for us. In my case, I fight it really hard to be a teacher, but I couldn't. But if I, since I couldn't be a teacher, I had the chance to travel to different countries, learn English, do my master's, do my PhD, being in like almost 60 countries with really great experiences from five continents. So in that case, when I look back, I say, okay, thankfully it didn't happen. I think if it happened, I wouldn't be here. So roughly this is end of my presentation and thank you so much for listening to me. Oh, well, thank you so much for sharing your story on that. Um, as somebody uh, who facilitated quite some of these ID talks before, I have to say this is an unbelievable activeness that we have in our um, chat. And there is so much of positive vibe coming here, but not only positive vibes, but a lot of questions. And I will like to pass the floor now to Maria uh, to report back a little bit from what's going on in the chat and maybe what are some of these most burning immediate questions, impressions that you have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you very much, Ondre, for the great uh, talk. Um, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, in the chat, uh, uh, people are so active and there are so, so, so many messages for you. I will be reading. There are some uh, uh, inspiring uh, messages for you, but also a few questions. So sure. I will read everything to you and then maybe in a few minutes, very shortly, you can address all of them at once. Mm -hmm. uh, so that we can have some time also for the next part of our uh, workshop today. Sure. So the first question is, what made you want to be a teacher? Which, of course, you have been mentioning your story about it. Mm -hmm. uh, a message is, another message is, Onder, I think you're amazing and very inspiring for everyone in the world, holding on to your dreams and goals the way you did. Let's, let's uh, see you have so much strength and positive energy in you that you can do everything you want. Another comment is, Onder, I saw that you're going to present tomorrow at the teacher training faculty of uh, ELTE University Budapest. I'm happy to see this. Please inspire the Hungarian teachers too. How did this invitation happen? Okay. And, <laughs> so you, you have to say the backstory. Mm -hmm. uh, then another comment is, thank you for your story. What is your digital experience like? How could IT professionals do to make apps more accessible to people with similar impairments? So you break a little bit, I think, because of the internet. Can you repeat the, this comment one more time, please? The, the last one. All right. Thank you for your story. What is your digital experience like? Oh, okay. How mm -hmm. could IT professionals do to make apps more accessible to people with similar impairments? I uh, just want to say that you were not lucky, you were persistent and devoted to your goals, you had integrity and a very strong character. Be humble, but always be proud of yourself and the changes you bring to society. Thank you. Um, 
because there's so many comments. I will stop okay. reading here uh, mm -hmm. just to let anyone, everyone know that uh, we will be passing all these comments to uh, under. And then maybe if you can take a few brief uh, moments to make uh, some comments before we do the next part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I was going to actually recommend, if you want, I can answer the questions uh, now, the, the ones you read um, briefly, and then uh, whilst you are going to through the comments, if there are other questions, kind of continue from there, but as you suggest. Yes, so, so what I would suggest, if you could very quickly address these three questions okay. that now Maria read for you, mm -hmm. and then we will be breaking into smaller rooms, and then when you come back, there will be probably more comments and more questions that okay. we would like to address. Perfect. Please. Uh, so the first question was, I think, what uh, makes me to be a teacher or wants to be a teacher? I think at that moment, um, as I said, I think the way how I am, it's because of my personality or characters, I'm generally criticizing a lot. And when I'm criticizing, I try to not only comment about the negative sides, but provide solutions. And based on my experience, I said, you know, all of the teachers I had, they could actually include people with disabilities better. And I think that was one of the main intention for me to be a teacher. Um, second, and the other one is, slight very small sentence but i think as a teachers we have incredible power because in each classroom each year we teach like hundreds and hundreds of students and a couple of years later they will be maybe teachers and they will uh, you know raise new people or new teachers so it's like a pyramid section from the top to bottom each year we got more and more people uh, who have like responsibilities for their environment, uh, like regarding disability or other issues. Like, uh, unfortunately, like uh, human rights is a big challenge uh, in many parts of the world, including Turkey. So, but by like as a teachers year by year, by raising number of people who are aware of those kind of things, uh, the world would be better. The other question I think was about the lecture. Uh, that was actually normally, the, uh, we had a, like I contacted the person from that department uh, at university, and I'm horrible with the pronunciation of that university. It's a tough name, but simply uh, I was going to do like a Erasmus ex uh, exchange for, the, um, for a week, but because of the COVID uh, that was canceled or let's say postponed for now. So, and then they asked me if I want to be like, if I would deliver such a uh, lecture and I say, sure, yeah, why not? And that's kind of one of the ways also about giving back, talking to other people and uh, learning from them. Not only I'm saying I am the expert and tell you what to do, but it's more like actually learning experience for me. That was it. Regarding digital, I think I'm okay with the, as a user, uh, accessible, uh, there are like a digital accessible guidelines actually on the Google, uh, if you type it, you would find lots of documents. So there are like, as long as if you uh, use the headings and other uh, labels, uh, it is possible to create accessible applications or digital materials. And for example, I use a screen reader, both on my phone and my, uh, computer so uh, and I access like almost everything without any problem so as long as we are aware of the accessibility it's similar to like buildings so uh, if we create uh, are aware of the different abilities same for the digital platforms we can make them accessible I think thank I you very that. much on that for trying to address all these questions in such a short time now we have uh, one more uh, opportunity to share questions. So uh, in a minute, uh, I'm trying to now share my screen. Um, in a minute, Maria will be sending you to smaller uh, Zoom rooms where we would like to ask you to, as a group, come up with just one per group question or an insight that you have after Onder's uh, amazing talk. I think uh, we can collect these questions right after you come back and try to address them as much as possible within the limited time we have. But I would also like to remind us that there will be an article uh, coming uh, on the basis of this talk afterwards. And whatever questions maybe we'll not be able to address immediately, these questions will enrich also the article. So please come back um, as soon as you are done discussing in your group 
now in the Zoom rooms with one question or one insight from your group uh, for uh, our speaker. So group number one, please, uh, what's your question or your insight after the, the input of one there? Hi, like I'm from the group number one, and we were wondering if there is the possibility to, instead of making a, a program for the education um, adapted for people with uh, some kind of impairment, if it would be possible to make us a kind of education available for everyone. So to mix in the same class people with impairment and without impairment, because we have seen that it's possible. So if it would be uh, useful for everybody to do that, or um, to educate more people in order to be able to know the needs of someone else and then make something special. Which one of the two options would be the most useful one for anybody? Yeah, thank you very much. And um, also, yeah, we will collect all the questions then let Onder um, answer all of them. In the meantime, please try to formulate your question and also write it down in the chat. Uh, room number two, please, you have the floor. Hello, everybody. So um, we just would like to ask what motivated uh, you on to move forward? I mean, um, have you received any kind of support on um, how to feel perfectly included uh, in your um, in your job environment? And basically, that's our question. I will write it down in the chat also. Thank you very much. Antonella, uh, room number three, please. Um, hi, I'm Hiko. Um, so our question was about the language. Uh, which one is the correct word to use? Blind, blind people, people with disability, people with impairment, or, and so this, this is the language question. Thank you very much, Hiko, and, and thank you for this question, especially because I think it raises a lot of awareness as well. Uh, group number four, please. Hi, and um, first of all, sorry, I cannot switch on my camera. I have a problem with it. And um, so basically we discussed um, that awareness is very important and a good starting point to actually reach um, the general community and increase awareness and knowledge. However, how can we push it beyond just awareness and knowledge to create inclusive spaces for all, for all different disability and impairment. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, and now group number five. Room five, anybody would like to come with a question? Um, uh, we're, we're only two people in this group and we, we have discussed about the topic of uh, what obstacles, what barriers do impaired people find when starting business or getting to the labor market. Uh, we, we think uh, the situation has in, hasn't changed in the last 10 years. It remains more or less the same. So it could be a real challenge for, for this uh, this group of people. Yeah, thank you for your question and for your opinion. And finally, group number six. Anybody from group number six would like to take the floor? Um, okay, then uh, maybe we um, start answering the questions. Uh, and if group number six, you still um, have a question, please type it in the chat. On that, you have the floor. It's an extremely complicated task now, I know. Very short time, very many questions. Each one of them could be a topic for another ID talk. But yes. please, if you could try to wrap it all up in uh, three, four minutes. Sure. Uh, the first question, uh, sorry, if I forget or miss, uh, I apologize in advance. The first one, definitely, I am also um, advocating for anything uh, like education materials or environment for all, rather than people with disabilities. So like universal design, 
and uh, also with some teachings and other things I try to increase in Turkey, we have a, like a science project as well. We want to make sure everyone could use the same materials at the same time rather than people with disabilities separate and then able or people without disabilities separate. So definitely I agree with you in that point. Uh, the other question was, sorry, I'll try to... What motivated you? Okay, for me... The or what supported you to, to move forward? <laughs> Yeah, for me, uh, I didn't receive any professional support, but I think main main motivation was always sitting uh, and thinking. And then I know I have only one life. Of course, different people have different part view reg regarding uh, reincarnation or whatever. But for me, I have only one life, which is uh, could be short or long. So instead of sitting at home for 60 years and doing nothing, I would prefer to go out, experience things, and maybe uh, die in 20 years or 30 years. So that was the kind of the way of thinking for me. So instead of staying for a long time, this is not the life I wanted to live. And the life I want to live is definitely uh, different than this, even though it might have some risks, as I mentioned in my speech. So this is the another one. Um, the other one regarding, I think it was uh, establishing a business with visual impairment and or going into the market. I think as a person with disabilities, I don't see too much, of course, like the general things regarding transportation and other things. But uh, for me, um, I don't find like particular barriers as long as it is typically same thing doing going to socialize. If I am able to go to cafe, I can go to that business or that governmental place to do things. Of course, the paperwork sometimes might be overwhelming, but I think that's uh, possible for everyone, like it's uh, ap applicable to everyone. In that sense, uh, I don't see too, of course, like as I said, my biggest or our difficult, uh, the biggest difficulty is we are gonna serve a small market. We want to make sure people with disabilities can access this, these materials, but uh, kind of reaching those and uh, kind of keep the business running at least by itself. So we don't want to make income for ourselves, but we need to keep it running. Regarding the other one is blind visual impairment, people with disabilities, disability. That's really difficult question. And uh, for me, the only thing I could say about this, this is not professional view. This is completely my own personal view and that could be different based on each person. So for me, I don't mind about the label. I am okay with the blind or visually impaired, but I've, and also it's linked to the culture actually and the language. Uh, I think in the United States, like blind refers to completely someone who could not see anything and same in Turkey, but in uh, different countries like visual impairment used for low vision and uh, for like a little bit broader term. For me uh, personally, I use the word visually impaired. I think it's a little bit safer than blind, but I'm okay with the blind word personally again. And it's f definitely, uh, I'm someone with a disability. So the person, as long as in the beginning, someone who is blind or people with visual impairment or people with disabilities is fine for me. This is my own personal view and not a, don't quote me the, on this. <laughs> um, I think there was one. More um, there is one last question as well here. I think we didn't miss any of those that were said out loud. If we missed, please write it in the chat. Um, the sixth group uh, identified itself finally in the chat. And their question is quite interesting, actually. How can we take your experience or, or, or this uh, conversation into youth work organization? How can this inspire youth work organizations to be as courageous as you are on there? I think uh, some, like the points I mentioned in the toward the last of my con uh, speech, I know they are again, not perfect, not professional, just like uh, things I draw out of my own experience. I think we need to try and always think about different paths if this is, could be possible. I think when we are working with people with disabilities, not all of them have the same experiences. Some of them, they never get out of their home. They have very slow self-confidence or self-esteem. So we need to keep that in mind and try to go step by step. 
uh, what we done, like, I don't think anyone in Turkey have done it, but we, there was like a, uh, someone with uh, intellectual disabilities and he was out of school. He was like 28 years old, doing nothing at home. And her mom was, some, sorry, his mom was complaining about him. And then when we met him, we thought, you know, actually we could make sure this guy is working in our canteen of the faculty. So like the cafeteria. And then of course, before we talk this idea, we went to the person who ran the canteen, the cafeteria. And I told him like, you know, we, there is someone like this and that. And can you like, one of the main aim is to include him in the society. So would you be willing to hire him in the beginning, just a couple hours in a week. And then if he can do it, you know, you progress there. And he was shocked in the beginning, but he was so happy at the same time. He said, yeah, like, uh, and what can he do? We discussed what he could do and what he cannot do. And then we told him, you know, the part of the jobs, he could definitely do this and that, blah, blah. And even the guy, like after a couple of days, he said, you know, I would, he had a very good communication with the all education students. And he said, I will make sure all of the students, when they come, they talk to him, they ask him how he is doing, blah, blah. So it's simply, he was actually, that person is like just running a canteen uh, and he was so willing to uh, work with us and with that person with intellectual disabilities to include him in the society so that he doesn't forget the skills and he even further develop his skills regarding uh, like independent living and social communication and other skills. So I think, uh, for the NGOs or the other groups, uh, it's not too different. Uh, the way how I see it, yes, we will be told that's not possible, but we need to go with some solutions, I think. We need to think different ways how this could be possible. Sometimes it's not white and black, but it can go gradually. And I think for the people with disabilities, we need to kind of... Uh, find the uh, potential interest like in terms of getting socialized or they want to be with their peers with and without disabilities so moving from that point seems helpful i hope i could answer this question yeah thank you very much we will revisit the questions again after the talk and we will make sure that all these questions comments and your words are passed on to on there in the meantime we came to this two super exciting moments in our ID talks. Now, first of all, maybe you have forgotten, but somebody has been working hard throughout the whole hour and a half uh, to produce a graphic recording of today's talk. So Olaja, we will ask you now to share with us the results and guide us a little bit through it. Parallel, before we close the day today, I would really ask you to put one word in the chat that summarizes your overall experience or your how you feel about today's ID talk. So please, while Olaja is sharing her screen, don't forget to go into the group chat and put your one word about today's ID talk. And then we will come back to close the day. Okay. I was just going to make a joke saying, if you don't like the talk, please do not be too harsh on me. Just be a little bit kind. <laughs> but yes, looking forward to read about your comments and uh, the additional questions as well. Please, Olaja, I, you now have the floor. Can you hear me correctly? Yes, yes, very well. Perfect. All right. So, I mean, thank you, Ander, for this. Uh, I shared during the breakout time that it was uh, really, really inspiring and, and so nice to actually follow your story and, and to extract the inputs. As uh, here I, I have recorded like the main highlights. And uh, what was very special was from the beginning when you shared with us uh, how it was your specific situation uh, growing up uh, with uh, different kind of obstacles, uh, geographical obstacles, uh, linguistic, um, physical obstacles as well, and how you go with it, with this. And what was interesting is that how not only you succeeded in achieving what you wanted to achieve, but how also you uh, created a path for other people with similar issues to actually have easier opportunities. So that was uh, a very strong point uh, that I that I gathered. Then you were also sharing ways uh, that you right now have of giving back uh, what you receive and throughout all your activities that are a lot uh, at university as coordinator, as professor, managing NGOs and giving courses. Here the main idea was that you advocate for everyday accessibility 
and you give support to people who are in this situation where you were maybe in the past. So that was uh, very inspiring. Also mm -hmm. with the part of uh, what to remember, what should you remember, not only maybe as a person with some uh, certain type of disabilities, but also with people that work with uh, young people or with others. So uh, these few tips were as well really, really inspiring and definitely food for thought. And last but not least, uh, just a few highlights and um, two of these, I gathered two quotes. And then the third one is something that for me was the key message of, of your talk is that uh, you change reality by never taking no as an answer. So you faced many different obstacles and you always persisted and you tried again and then you got to the point where you wanted to be. So this was uh, really, really inspiring. And yeah, as long as we don't quit, we will always find ways to succeed. That's true. Thank you so Thank much you for the so nice much. words. Thank you so much, Olaja. Uh, just to remind all of our audience that the recording, uh, the graphic recording, but also the video recording and on their article will be very soon available on the social media channels of Salto Inclusion and Diversity. So don't forget uh, to follow us. And thank you very, very much for actively contributing to the discussion in the chat and sharing your impressions. Yes, we are very close to closing the day today. Onder, if you would like to take the floor and, and just uh, yeah, say your final words before the goodbyes, you have the floor now. Thank you so much. And again, thank you very much for the whole Salto family for this kind invitation and for the people who participated and listened to me, gave their time. Um, I think, uh, again, like, still sometimes struggling about being like or pretending as if I am the expert to this and that but my advice is definitely for you and the people who are you working with sometimes very really small things really could make huge changes I think I could see that definitely from my life and uh, from many other people whom I work with so I think definitely yes we should not quit and also sometimes talking to the people and try to find a path uh, to move on from there is the key message. Because, yes, we will face barriers in our life every day, every moment in different areas. But if we struggle or if we stuck there, we cannot move any forward. But we need to move forward. And this is, could be uh, sometimes from different path, even like moving backward is kind of a movement, which is still forward than the point we are. So uh, I, I all thank you and admire the work you have doing because it is you are changing life of people with disabilities uh, from younger ages. As I mentioned, for me, it was like 20, 25 years old almost when I start to recognize things and it was already maybe too late. But for the people who are going to be working with or you are working with, that small touches might uh, really make huge impact on their life. So thank you for everyone and thank you for having me. Thank you.